This week, the third in uh, the series on discipleship, Uh, this week is the discipline of fasting, which I've called Light in the Darkness, Discipleship Series Week 3. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The Lord, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the noonday and your gloom be as the noonday. That's Isaiah 58, 6-10. I'm going to review what we've, what we've talked about, about discipleship so far. Uh, The passage that I've read every week and will probably continue to read every week that I talk about discipleship is Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus is speaking, and he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And this is also found in Matthew 10.38, Matthew 16.24, Mark 8.34, and Luke 14.27. In the synoptic Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it shows up five times, this same phrase. And as I said the last couple of weeks, the cross was an instrument of torture. It wasn't immediately recognized as a religious symbol, but as a political one. And not just a political one, but, an, but a political instrument of fear. It was reserved explicitly for insurrectionists against the empire, not just everyday criminals. So when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, the symbol was not religious yet. Those hearing him say it would not have applied it to him because he had not been crucified upon one. So, take up your cross and follow me would more likely be heard by a first century Palestinian in this way. As I am resisting the unjust, violent, occupying forces of the evil Roman Empire, so should you. Give up your demand for a comfortable life and live the hard road of resistance. The consequences of such a life will follow you. Still, continue to actively live for justice until you die at the hands of that empire you resist. That's pretty hardcore. Now, the last two weeks I have not said this, but uh, this week I was reminded when um, an activist friend of mine messaged me on Facebook. I don't know if he'd listened to the message that I put on YouTube or not, but he messaged me on Facebook and he is, uh, he is nominally Christian and loves to talk to me about Jesus uh, turning over the tables in the temple and all that sort of thing. Uh, and he said, so, so Sean, are you ready to live a life of martyrdom? And I told him, no. And this is my, <laughs> so this is my caveat. Um, when, I say, when I read what I just did, I am not suggesting that we seek martyrdom. That is not what I am suggesting. My my intention in reading that is to share the cost of discipleship, not the goal of discipleship. Um, When Christ says, take up your cross and follow me, he is not shying away from the fact that the cost very well may be death. And for the early Christians, for many of them it was. But uh, that doesn't mean that we have to live a life where somehow trying to die at the hands of of a corrupt government is, is somehow something we should seek. No, don't seek that, please. And I didn't say that. Thank you. Um, so it is the cost of discipleship. Also, this isn't necessarily the only thing that it could mean. We understand that taking up your cross does have a spiritual meaning as well. That we recognize that we are following after our rabbi Jesus. To follow after a rabbi, to be a disciple, means to be a duplicate of the master. And Christ lived differently than those around him. He lived righteously in an unrighteous culture. 
um, as, as a, a person among people who were living occupied, a native culture occupied by a, by a colonizing force. And he did die. But um, we follow Jesus, and if we say that we are disciples of the rabbi, then we are willing to live like Jesus did. Necessary for discipleship is discipline, the discipline to follow wherever our master leads. So two weeks ago was the call to discipleship. And the, the, uh, the thesis of that message was that we resolve to follow Christ by faith. Through us, Christ is glorified. Discipleship is unutterably difficult. We can't be like Jesus. Um, but through faith in Jesus, he will give us the power by the Holy Spirit to live like he did. We are called to be disciples that make disciples, Matthew 28, 18-20. Making disciples is a mandate of the church. It is my number one responsibility as one of the pastors in this church, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we follow Christ together. To be an example of discipleship to one another, we must display a life of open and frequent willing repentance. To be an example of Christ to one another does not mean that we scrub up the life that people can see and try and pretend that it's perfect. That's not what Jesus does and that's not what he calls us to do. But rather we can humbly show ourselves to one another as the human beings that we are and submit those pieces of us that fall short to Christ and uh, confess those things to one another that we be healed. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12 says... To this end, we all, always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So from that we know that yes, we may resolve to do good. We are not irresolute. We are not duplicitous. We are simple. Simplicity. Pursue the good action by faith in Christ. We resolve to follow Christ by putting our faith in Christ. God acts through our faith by His power. God fulfills the good thing we've resolved to do. He fulfills it through us, and Jesus is glorified. Last week, uh, the message was called The Discipline of Simplicity, subtitled Make Affluence History. And uh, simplicity defined was in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 33. Matthew 6, 25 says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Yada, yada, yada. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You can listen to the message on YouTube if you'd like, or you can read the passage yourself, um, because this is a review. Uh, but before we take a second step towards a life of simplicity, towards a life of discipleship, even before we take a first step, we must do nothing. We must believe by faith that it is Jesus Christ alone who does the work for us. We do not seek our own righteousness. We lay our unrighteousness and our righteousness down and we seek his righteousness. Because he alone makes us worthy of the kingdom. When our sin meant that we could never be vessels of righteousness, Jesus loved us and went to the cross in our place, becoming sin for us so that we could be made righteous as he is. This is the faith, that, this is the work of Christ that we put our faith in. It is Jesus who plants the Holy Spirit within us, making us immediately justified before God. We are at the end of the race before we even begin. There is nothing that we must do to be acceptable to God, and our willing yes, our obedience to follow in discipleship, is not because of a need to please God, but because of the power that he gives us to be like him. He changes us from within into the human persons he always intended us to be. And then, in that place of silence and rest, when we have done nothing and we recognize that because of Christ we can be made holy, 
then all these things are added unto us. But this place of rest does not leave us free to not act. On the contrary, James 1.25 says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And in James 2.26, as it says in several places in James, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. The rich ruler that Jesus spoke to was not to just have a peaceful inner detachment from his belongings when he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Instead, Jesus said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It was an actual act, a practical act that he asked him to do of obedience. Practical action, not just a spiritual detachment. Our faith is not one that is just based on changing our mindset and believing a philosophy and then living exactly like the rest of the world, trying to accrue wealth and chase after power. Jesus changes us and then we act differently. Luke 12.33 says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Luke 6.30 says, give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Luke 12, 15, at the beginning of the story of the hoarding rich man, he says, Jesus says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. We are free from anxiety or contentment from our possessions because we trust our provider. We have no contentment in our possessions, we have, no, we have nothing in this life that we must chase after to be content, but rather what I said about that place of rest, that is where our contentment lies. And because of that, we have the power to live like Jesus. The riches of this world are kindling. Why do we even try to follow Christ if it is so unutterably difficult? This is new material now. We attempt to follow Christ because in faithfully pursuing God's work of sanctification, His work in us, we will grow in our depth of love and relationship with our rabbi. Our successes, our obedience, will be used by the Holy Spirit to teach us about the Father. And our failures and the grace we receive after we've repented and said, I messed up again. This will also minister God's inexhaustible love to us and redeem us and redeem us further, even through our failings. We follow obediently and willingly, and God has his way in us when we are right and when we are wrong. And this is our freedom. Whether we succeed or fail, God has his way with us and his purpose for the world will remain. God will have his way. And then we are, disip- we are invited to participate in God's work in the world. And this is God's beautiful, unnecessary condescension to us. As Jesus condescended to become one of us so that we may be made like him. It is a joy a joy to be invited into our daddy's work. God says, I'm redeeming the world, friends. Would you like to help? Would you like to join me? Would you like to see what I'm doing? My kids like to help me clean up after supper. Sometimes they like helping to to make the dinner. This is especially fun with stir fries. I'll, I'll, I'll grab all the veggies and I'll put them on the counter and then I will chop them up and the kids will sit at the table with a cutting board and a butter knife and bang the butter knife against the cutting board while I'm actually cutting vegetables on the counter. And then, uh, and then I take them all and I put them all into bowls and then I, I put the pot on the stove and I turn it on and I put the oil in and then when it's hot I lift up my child and I put the bowl in their hand and then they take it and they dump it in because they're helping with dinner. And then, after, and then after dinner, they like to help clean up. Last week, Elijah helped me clean up after supper, and it was awesome. 
He put the sauce away in the fridge, but he's not strong enough to open the fridge. Um, so he, he also can't get down from his chair while holding the sauce, and he can't reach the sauce on the table. So he gets down from the chair, then I put the sauce in his hands. Then I open the fridge for him, and then he walks into the fridge, and then he puts it on the bottom shelf, and then he walks out, and then he helps me close the fridge. And he helps. Um, he put the spices in the cupboard, which of course is too high. So I lift him up until he's as high as the cupboard, and then I open the cupboard door while he's in my hands, and then I put the spice in his hands, and then he puts it in the cupboard. <laughs> and he loves it. He loves helping Daddy. And, and friends, if he wasn't helping, his dinner would probably be very similar. And in fact, it takes a little longer to make the dinner having him help. It takes a little longer cleaning up. But it is my pleasure to have him join me. It is God's pleasure to invite us to join him in his work. And he loves us even when we do not. Um, when we saw the hobbit Kate and I, after uh, the, the most recent Hobbit, I won't give you any spoilers, but uh, uh, after we saw the movie, uh, she was laughing afterwards, and, um, and there's, there's a scene where the, uh, the dwarves are going down a river in, uh, in a barrel, and, uh, um, and, and there's a bunch of orcs after them, and, and, there's a, a, and then Legolas is jumping across the river back and forth with a sword and arrows, and he's like just taking out all these orcs on all sides, like just Superman, just everywhere, just bang, bang, whoosh, whoosh, you know, swords coming from behind, and he still blocks it anyway. And then a little later, I can't remember if it's before or after, but one of the dwarfs ends up like bouncing onto the, onto the shore in his barrel, and he's like bouncing along the shore and bouncing and hitting all these, all these orcs, as he bounces, and so, so Kate said, so basically the takeaway is that one elf with a sword and a bow is equally effective to a dwarf accidentally bumping around in a barrel. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, and friends, um, it, it's fun to watch that and think that we're the dwarf with the bow, or the, uh, the elf with the bow, um, but the good news is, uh, you know, we're dwarves in a barrel and uh, God's going to make our obedience useful. And that's pretty exciting. Fasting. So last week, uh, last week in, the, in the family talk afterwards, we talked about discipline and simplicity, and someone suggested that we could have a, a fast together. We could share in this. And so I suggested perhaps we'll talk about fasting next week, since not everyone here has ever done it before or quite knows. So that's what we're going to talk about. Simplicity that we talked about last week is an outward discipline. It's something that we're going to do that people are going to see. And that's fine. That's fine. Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 says this, verses 13 to 16. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a, on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It is right and good for our personal relationship with Jesus to be seen in what we do that what we do can be seen by others and, and that our faith is not just a, a personal thing but is expressed in such a way that it changes our lives and people can actually see. Like, everybody else uses the styrofoam cups at work. Why do you always carry, uh, you know? Um, or what, whatever it is that we're doing in the, in the realm of simplicity as I spoke of last week. Um, when we, when we do these things, when we're participating in God's work in the world, it can be seen, and that is good. But fasting is not like that. Fasting is an inward discipline. It's something that isn't to be displayed. It isn't something for people to see. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 5 is concerned very much about things that we do that, that are, are, are disciplined life that people can see. Matthew chapter 6 
almost seems to be contradictory because he jumps from let everyone see what you're doing to suddenly a whole chapter of don't let anybody see what you're doing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So, this is a both-and situation. Let your, let your good works shine so that the Lord may be glorified, and also, do not practice your righteousness in order to be seen by people. Verse 16 says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We do not... So when we fast, one of the first things that Jesus has to say about it is our intention. Are we doing this so that, so that others can see us, or are we doing this because we're in an attitude of worship and prayer before God? We're not doing this to be miserable or so that people can see how miserable we are or how spiritual we are. We're doing this before God. Prayer and scripture is our spiritual food. Fasting reminds us that it is God who sustains us before we work. It, we, we may understand that prayer and scripture is our, is our spiritual food, but we, perhaps, perhaps you have a discipline of, of praying in the morning every day or, or reading some scripture or you study or you memorize scripture or something like that, Um, or perhaps you don't. Either way, we'd all agree with that, but fasting makes it real and says, I really actually believe that this is my sustenance. Not that we could, you know, go a lifetime without eating, but we recognize that we are sustained in a greater way by the Spirit of God within us. And it reminds us of that during the time that we're abstaining from food. Sabbath reminds us before we work, sorry, Sabbath reminds us while we work that it is God who enables us to produce good things. So fasting reminds us before we've done any work that God sustains us to do the work he's called us to do. Sabbath reminds us while we're working that we can take a rest because it's God that's actually doing the work, we're just helping out. And giving reminds us after we work and we've received some sort of fruit from what we've done, that it is God who provides. So it is likely that Sabbath and giving will also be their own messages in weeks to come. Galatians 6.8 says, The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Spiritual discipline sows to the Spirit. Fasting is one of those disciplines. I'm going to take a brief moment for a parenthetical just so you know here, clarification. I am not speaking in Gnostic terms. There is a, there is a tendency in the evangelical church to have a, a pseudo-Gnostic view of our, of our spiritual life, where everything that is physical is, is bad, and everything that is spiritual is good. A- and, and Jesus doesn't actually call us to that kind of discipleship, and, and his, the, the story of Scripture is not one where we we need to reject the physical for some sort of you know, ethereal goodness. Salvation is holistic. God wants us to be healthy in our spirit, yes, in our soul, in our emotions, in our mind, and also in our body. And it is not wrong for us to, to be healthy and to care for the physical, our relationships as well. These things are in the present and in the physical. That's a good thing. So... We are not ascetics, as I said last week. So, what about fasting in the Bible? What is fasting? Throughout Scripture, fasting refers to abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Uh, This is um, not the same as a hunger strike, where where we stop eating for some sort of social gain, or a diet, where we stop eating for some sort of physical gain. It is for a spiritual purpose. Throughout Scripture, only abstaining from food is called fasting. It's become uh, popular today as, as, uh, in the evangelical church to talk about, like, hey, 
I'm not playing any video games for this week because I'm fasting video games. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it isn't actually the discipline of fasting as it's described in Scripture. And, uh, and I think that it is that it does matter to make the distinction. One of the things that I discovered as I, as I studied this week is that in the North American church, fasting has been seriously watered down. It's in, uh, it's in the developing nations. Oh man, I just used the word developing. I hate doing that. <laughs> it's, uh, okay, forget I said developing. Um, it's in, it's in uh, uh, countries with less privilege where believers are more likely to fast. And in North America, we're more likely to talk about giving um, because we have a lot. But the idea of denying ourselves and saying no to our bodies is, uh, is so countercultural. Um, yeah, biblical, facts, biblical fasting always centers on spiritual purposes. So in Scripture, the normal means of fasting involves, this is the most common, there's, there's going to be uh, two other um, exceptions, but most commonly, it involves abstaining from all food, solid or liquid, but not from water for a period of time. So normally, they also drink water. From a physical st- standpoint, this is what's usually involved. So, remember, it is for a spiritual purpose and has a spiritual end. But from a physical standpoint, that is what we're talking about. But sometimes in Scripture, there's, there's a partial fast. And the most common example is Daniel. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, uh, he normally had regular fasts, like what I just described. But there was a three-week period in which he said, I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. So, we can assume then that he continued to eat grains and that he continued to maybe drink fruit and vegetable juice. He just didn't drink wine. Um, but we don't know why. We don't know why he did that. Um, it's possible that because he was uh, in a governmental position in Babylon that he wasn't able to fast uh, because of his duties in the governmental position. We don't know. Um, I think it's interesting that the Daniel fast has become also very popular in the North American church because it's a little bit, it's a little bit less. Um, but uh, but it, is, it is legitimately in Scripture, and, and yeah, perhaps I'm going to be vegan for a while. I did a vegan fast for 40 days one time, um, and I will never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shoot, I'm going to eat my words. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, there's also examples in Scripture of what can be called an absolute fast. So that's, that's a time where people didn't eat or drink anything, even drink water. The best example of that is when Esther tells Mordecai in Esther 4.16, it says, have the whole nation fast, including water. Um, there's a couple other times as well, and they're always like the story of Esther, times of, of, of extreme desperate need. Um, so yeah, but I don't recommend it. Uh, this is an unhealthy thing to do. Um, I wrote down, uh, the absolute fast is the exception. Um, I don't recommend it unless you feel absolutely convicted by God to do so. And if that is the case, then I, sit, then I recommend that you seek good counsel as well. Um, if you feel God's telling me to, to do a fast like this, go and talk to some people that you trust and trust their wisdom because God can speak to them too and also talk to your doctor. Um, and you will probably hear from them the same thing that I said. I don't recommend it. Um, in most cases, fasting is a private matter between the individual and God. However, there's an exception here as well. Uh, there are times uh, of corporate fasting. So last week, when Aaron Gannon said, hey, maybe we could have a fast as a church, we have an example of that in Scripture as well. So it's, it's a personal thing, yet sometimes people fast. The, uh, the story of Esther is one of them. The official public fast in Scripture is in Leviticus 23, at the Day of Atonement. This was an annual public fast by the people of Israel. In Joel 2.15... It says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, and all the people would fast. King Jehoshaphat called a fast in Second Chronicles 20. The people of Nineveh fasted after Jonah came and said, you need to repent 
They fasted as a sign of their repentance. And Ezra had the exiles fast for safety in Ezra 8, 21 to 23. So group fasts can be done. And when a fast is done corporately, it can be a wonderful and powerful experience if people are in unity, if people know what they're doing, and uh, if they're, they're choosing to do it in faith together. Um, serious problems in churches, disunity, and other groups of people can be dealt with, and sometimes relationships even healed through a united fasting. Um, there have been national fasts. I found one example. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the king of Britain called for a day of fasting in 1756. And during that time, John Wesley was, uh, was in England and he wrote about that fast. So you can read about that. In Jesus' days, the Pharisees fasted. In Luke, in Luke 18.12, he challenges them and says, you shouldn't use fasting as something to boast about um, because apparently they would boast, I fast twice a week. Tradition tells us that they fasted on, I think it was Mondays and Thursdays. They would fast on Mondays and Thursdays because that was uh, um, market day, so more people would see that they were fasting. So they, they actually sometimes like blew trumpets and told people, I'm fasting, so now I'm going to pray. And then they'd pray and then there'd be lots of people there so they would see them doing it. Um, that's what we're supposed to not do. Um, the Methodists fast, fasted. Uh, in fact, um, what's his name? Excuse me. John Wesley. John Wesley of the Methodists was so, was so into fasting that he fasted every Wednesday and Friday, and he actually said that he would not ordain someone unless they fasted every Wednesday and Friday because he thought it was that important. So fasting is, is in Scripture, it is part of our history, it is part of the history of the church. But it has become uncommon, and so we talk, about it, we talk about it from an elementary point of view because sometimes we don't even know how anymore. So I'm going to get practical. Paul said that freedom came from fasting often, 2 Corinthians 11.27. So why do we fast? fast? Fasting is an act of worship unto God. I'm going to read a passage from the Celebration of Discipline. I wanted to have at least one time that I pick this up and show you because I've been reading this book. It's on the Christian disciplines and fasting is in here. Um, and so this is my plug by Richard Foster. He is a Quaker. And Quakers are pretty cool. Look them up on Wikipedia. It says here, To use good things to our own ends, is always the sign of false religion. We fast unto God, for God, in God's strength. Not for our own seeking to try and become better or try to be uh, right before God in our own strength. How easy it is to take something like fasting and try to use it to get God to do what we want. At times there is such stress upon the blessings and benefits of fasting that we could be tempted to believe that with a little fast we could have the world, including God, eating out of our hands. I was in a church, I was part of a church that once had a, a, a time of fasting once a year that they would call moving the hand of God. And uh, that, that name always bugged me and speaks to this exact idea that I'm talking about. Worship and fasting go together. Luke chapter 2.37 says that worship and fasting go together. Acts 13.2 says that the apostles worshipped and fasted together. Do you know what fasting is called without worship? It's called, it's called hungry. That's all it is. It's not what we're talking about. God has his intention for fasting for us. When we fast, we must allow God to define that fast. I'm going to read Isaiah 58, 6-10 again. Here is God's desire for our fast. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself 
from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour out yourself for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And you can see in that what I read at the beginning and read it again now, that much of what I've said is in there. That fasting together can bring people together, that it can remind us to, to, to watch the way that we speak of one another. And fasting is also an act of solidarity. This is secondary, secondary to our worship of God. But yes, when we fast, we remember what it's like to be hungry because we so often are not hungry, but many are. I, uh, I had a friend once who was part of a church where they would fast one meal a week and they would take the amount of money they would normally spend on that meal and they would use that money to feed people who otherwise don't get to eat. It was a practice that they did. That's very appropriate. Here we see God's intention for fasting as the same intention as for simplicity. God intends for our inward faithfulness, even these disciplines that are not seen, to change us in such a way as to result in an outward action of justice and mercy and love in the world. We put first God's kingdom we remind ourselves by fasting that it is God alone who feeds us. In our active obedience, we are fed by God and we come to know God better. Our hearts, our desires, our minds are changed, sanctified to God's purpose and perspective. Our actions follow. We begin to more rightly do God's work in the world by God's strength. And Christ is glorified. Deuteronomy 8 and Matthew 4.4 I talked about Deuteronomy 8 last week as well. Deuteronomy 8 is so appropriate for this whole message. Read it. It's awesome. Matthew 4.4. 4. If, if you read the Matthew chapter 4, which is the story of Jesus fasting um, in, the, in the wilderness, as he's fasting, he's tempted. And if you read Matthew 4.4, 4, it, it is a parallel of Deuteronomy 8, which is awesome. Deuteronomy 8 talks about the Israelites in the desert for 40 years during which time it says, I, I caused you to hunger so that you would learn that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's in Deuteronomy 8. And then in Matthew 4, it says that Jesus was fasting and he fasted for 40 days and at the end of that 40 days, he was hungry. And then the devil came and said, why don't you turn some of these stones into bread? And he said, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you see the parallel? I love that. That's so beautiful. 40 days in the desert, 40 years in the desert. Made hungry, made hungry. This is what they learn. We are fed by God. God sustains us. All things hold together in Christ, it says in Colossians chapter 1. So fasting is feasting on Christ. Feasting on God's good work. The sustainer of all things. John 4, 32 and 34, Jesus said to his, uh, to his disciples, I have food that you don't know about. My food is to do the work of God. So this is why we are not miserable when we fast. We don't need to ash our faces and go to the marketplace and blow a trumpet and say, I'm so miserable and righteous. We are happy. This is a celebration of discipline. Because it is a time when we are feasting on the goodness of God. Fasting is a joy when it is done in faith. And like everything else in this series, that's at the, the core of the matter. It's not an, an act of legalism, but an act of faith. It's a joy because we are feasting on God. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says that all things are lawful, but I will not be enslaved. Fasting reminds us in the core of our being what are our true priorities. This is why fasting often leads to breakthrough in unhealthy or sinful habits. I have a friend that fasts once a week and, uh, and he said that 
that he once had a, uh, an addiction that he struggled with. And then he began fasting once a week. He fasted two meals during the day, once a week. And during that time, he would dedicate his time to God and his mind to God. And he would say, say God, I'm, during this time that I am denying myself food for two days, remind me that I have the strength to do this. And when I am tempted with this addiction, in that same spirit, I will resist that as well. This is one of the, the greatest powers of fasting. Paul disciplined his own body, 1 Corinthians 6.12, and David afflicted himself with fasting. Psalm 35.13 Fasting places our will firmly in the hands of the Spirit because it is the common sin of North American people to have our will decided entirely by our, 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 very, our every whim and desire because so much is given to us. Instead, our will is in the hands of our spirit. Believers live supernaturally, in faith according to the spirit. Our will is to be subject to the spirit and our flesh subject to our will. We are not bound by our desires, but freed to follow God according to God's good purpose for us. Now I'm going to give you some practical stuff about fasting in about five minutes or less, and then we'll talk about it. So, there's my, there's my pitch on fasting. And now you're all saying, this sounds great, Sean. How do I do that? Here's some ideas. Um, How to fast. First of all, walk before running. Um, And by that I mean start slow. I don't recommend that you say this week, I'm going to join the church in a week-long fast and not eat until next Sunday. Do not recommend that you do that, especially if you have never fasted before. Start with a shorter fast. For example, 24 hours. From after an early lunch, have lunch at 11.30 and fast at noon, until before a late lunch the following day. You skip two meals, uh, dinner and breakfast. That also means that you're ending your fast with lunch, which is a great way to end your fast. Or a day and two nights. So from after supper on one day until before breakfast two days later. So during one single day you don't eat. Whichever you decide, if you're starting with something slow like that, determine the time period before you start. Don't decide, I'm going to fast for however long it takes. Um, Decide ahead of time and then dedicate yourself to God for that time. Be prepared to set aside that time for worship and prayer. And to be prepared to set aside that time for worship and prayer, abstain from anything else that would distract you from setting the time aside. Because you'll be hungry. And we are we are we are used to when we are hungry or in need turning to our comforts. An example that I'll use, because this is probably true for me, is decide during that time that you're going to abstain from media like television or movies or YouTube or Facebook or social media. It's very common for me when I'm, you know, anxious or bothered or whatever to grab the iPod and Facebook for a while. Ah, that feels better. But we're not self-medicating right now. Right now we're in a time of fasting. This helps us to be disciplined when we're not fasting. Wouldn't it be great if instead of opening Facebook I remembered to go to the cross? Um... So perhaps you want to try this 24 hours, skip a, skip a, um, a supper and a breakfast, and, and fast and pray during that time. You could do this frequently. You could make a habit of this. This, uh, all over the world, is a common practice among Christians to take a period of time like that and to do that once a week or once a month. If you've had success and you experience the joy of one of these, successfully, and you go, hey, this really is a joyful thing, and look at the freedom in my life, then maybe you can try two or three days. I recommend ending a fast with breakfast or lunch, not with supper. Um, End the fast at a time when you're going to have a couple more meals coming up. And I also recommend ending a fast slowly and lightly, um, especially if it's any longer than a day. 
So, and a fast with a breakfast or lunch, and start with a light meal. Don't overfeed yourself. You are, uh, you, your body needs to get used to food again. Um, for example, have a slow meal of fruit and vegetables. Don't gorge yourself. Just eat slowly and drink lots of water and fruit and vegetable juice. Also, start a fast with a light meal. You might say, I'm going to fast starting at lunch today, so I'm going to just eat the biggest breakfast possible. This actually, gives you, this actually makes you more uncomfortable, not more comfortable during the fast. Don't do that. It's also more damaging. Um, I capitalized this next sentence, and it's near the end of my notes here. Drink lots of water during your fast. Drink lots and lots of water. Carry a water bottle around and just drink water. This will also increase your comfort during the fast. Um, talk to your doctor before attempting a fast longer than three days. And certainly talk to your doctor if you intend to do it for more than a week. When you're ending a longer fast, begin with mild, low-acid fruit juice or vegetable juices for at least the first meal or longer. If your fast is more than a few days, don't even start with fruits and vegetables. Just start with fruit juice, low acid, and uh, get yourself used to it again. And uh, yeah, also end it with joy because it is a joy.